Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he reports, he recorded a hadith by way of Abu Zinad, who heard from Al A'raj, who reported from Abu Huraira. That is the chain of the hadith. And the reason I mentioned the chain of this hadith is because Imam Bukhari called this chain one of the As-Silsilatul Dhahabiyya. He called it one of the golden chains of narration. Meaning a chain like this one reaches the highest level of trustworthiness and authenticity. And the significance here is that this hadith that we're about to narrate is a story about a man from Bani Israel. And these stories are commonly known as Israeliyat. Israeliyat. Many times, these stories that came to us through Bani Israel, we are not always able to confirm the authenticity of these reports. But this story here is told to us by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and reaches us through one of the Silsilatu Al-Dhahabiyya, one of, one of the golden chains of narration. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he tells us about a man from Bani Israel, whom Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala blessed with wealth, and he blessed with family. But as with most people, unfortunately, the wealth and the family busied him from the remembrance of Allah. It busied him from the true purpose of life. Until a time when death was approaching this man. And he still believed in Allah. He knew that there was an akhirah. He knew that there might be punishment waiting for him on the other side. So the first question that one of us might ask ourselves, what if I felt the pangs of death coming to me now? What have I prepared? What have I put together for myself to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with tomorrow? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, قَالَ رَجُلْ لَمْ يَعْمَلْ حَسَنَةً قَدْ لِأَهْلِهِ This man who did not do a single hasana, لَمْ يَعْمَلْ حَسَنَةً قَدْ he didn't do a single good deed. قَالَ لِأَهْلِهِ He said, so he said to his family when death approached him. <clears throat> In the narration of Bukhari, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, لَمْ يَعْمَلْ خَيْرًا قَطْ إِلَّا التَّوْحِيدِ Except for what? Except that he believed in Tawheed. He didn't do a single good deed. Except that he still believed in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So he knew there was accountability. He knew that he was going back to Allah. Now how do we understand this here? There's a little bit of a... Uh, uh, how do we understand the fact that he still believed in Tawheed? We know Tawheed as we know it, it has belief in the heart. It has statements that we have to say. It has actions that we have to do. It has, it has conditions for it to be fulfilled properly. Isn't that what Tawheed is the way we know it? The answer is yes. But there's different levels of Tawheed. In order to perfect Tawheed is one thing, and having a minimum level of Tawheed, as in the case of this man, is something else. So he told his family, إِذَا مَاتْ, as the narrator says about him, إِذَا مَاتَ فَحَرِّقُوا He told his family, if I die, then do what? Then cremate my body. فَحَرِّقُوا Why? I don't want to face Allah. So destroy my body, cremate it, burn it. I don't want to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the statement here, إذا مات فحرقوا بالتشديد تدل على المبالغة. With the شدة here, حرقوا, not أحرقوا. Not just burn him, not just burn my body, but annihilate my body completely. Burn me to smithereens. Because I cannot bear to do what? to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, he didn't know the abilities of Allah. مَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ He didn't know the true ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do whatever he pleases and to bring everybody back to life. Now, we know that cremation was not the norm at the time. Somebody might say, maybe it was the norm for people to cremate themselves, but that is not the case. The norm throughout history was for people to bury their dead. And this goes all the way back to the children of Adam, 
as we know the story of the, in the Quran, when one of them killed the other, فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ غُرَابًا يَبْحَثُ فِي الْأَرْضِ لِيُرِيَهُ كَيْفَ يُوَارِ سَوْءَةَ أَخِي So Allah sent a crow, a bird, digging into the earth to show him how to dispose the corpse of his brother. These were who? These were the two sons of Adam. So the norm from the beginning was to do what? Was to bury the dead. So this idea of cremation was not the norm. He was going against the norm. Not only that, but he said, ثُمَّ ذَرُوا ثُمَّ ذَرُوا نِصْفَهُ فِي الْبَرْ وَنِصْفَهُ فِي الْبَحْرِ He told his family, not only that, he wanted to make sure that he's not going to face Allah. After you cremate my body and burn me to smithereens, take half of the ashes and disperse them over the land. And then take the other half of the ashes and disperse them over the ocean. I want to make sure that there is no way that I can be brought back to life. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, again, His logic is that He's not going to be brought back to life on the Day of Judgment. And He says, فَوَاللَّهِ لَإِنْ قَدَرَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ لَيُعَذِّبَنِي عَذَابًا لَا يُعَذِّبُهُ أَحَدًا مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ If Allah were to get a hold of me, He would punish me with a punishment that nobody else would be punished with. So again, that shows that he still believed in Allah. <clears throat> and there was a little bit, at least a little bit of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was left with this man. Some of the scholars, they said that this man lived at a time between the sending of the great messengers. At a time between the messenger, على فترة من الرسل, as Allah says in the Quran, that there would be one messenger sent and then there could be a period of time before the next one is sent. So what exactly reached him of the previous message is unknown. <clears throat> However, the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was still there. How would a person be held accountable then? If the message didn't reach him, how is a person to be held accountable? The scholars, they speak about this in detail. A person might be judged based on their leaving of sins based on staying away from evil, based on the fitrah, the moral compass that Allah placed inside of every human being. Did the person follow that moral compass to the best of their abilities? They would be judged based upon that. Or maybe they will be tried with another trial on the Day of Judgment. All of these are possibilities. And there are examples of this at the time of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. There was a man living in Mecca whose name was Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. Zayd lived in Mecca before the prophethood. He even met the Prophet Muhammad sallam, but before the wahi descended upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this man Zayd, he was known in Mecca as a Hanif, as a person who believed in Tawheed. He avoided shirk in all of its forms. He avoided the religions of the people of the time. And he used to say to the people in Mecca, "Wallahi, ma asbaha minkum ala ahad ala din Ibrahim khairi." He used to say to the people of Mecca, "There's none of you that remains upon the religion of Ibrahim except for me. None of you remains upon that religion. Whatever was remaining of the religion, the message of Ibrahim did not exist in its complete form at that time. But they knew of some parts of it. They knew about." Tawheed. So he told them, I'm still upon the Tawheed of Ibrahim, and none of you are. And it was narrated about Zayd that he would not eat of the Mayta. He would not eat of the animals that were slaughtered in the name of the idols. The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam once met Zayd, again before the Prophethood. He said, فَقُدِّمَ لَهُ طَعَامٌ فَأَبَى أَنْ يَأْكُلُ Food was presented to him, and he refused to eat from it. And he said, We don't eat of the food that you slaughter in the name of your idols. We only eat of that which the name of Allah is mentioned upon. SubhanAllah, at a time when there's no message to follow, he refused to eat from the meat that's slaughtered in the name of the idols. He he declares his belief in Tawheed. And Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, 
she narrated about Zayd that he would go to the men who were going to kill their newborn daughters. The norm, of course, at the time was to bury the, the newborn daughters alive. So he would go to these men and he would say to them, يَذْهَبُ إِلَى الرَّجُلْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَقْتُلِ ابْنَتَهُ And he would say to him, لَا تَقْتُلْهَا أَنَا أَكْفِيكَ مَأُونَتَهَا Don't kill her. I will take care of her for you. فَإِذَا كَبُرَتْ And when she grows up, إِذَا أَرَدْ دَفَعْتُهَا إِلَيْكَ If you want her back at that time, I will give your daughter back to you. And if you don't want her back at that time, I will continue to take care of her for you. Subhanallah. A man who opposes the norms and the society and everything going on around him. Zayd ibn Amr. Eventually he got fed up with the Meccans and he decided to go search for the truth somewhere else. So he got to Asham. And in Asham, he was told that the last messenger will soon come and he's going to come to Arabia. So he got happy hearing this news and started to head back to Mecca. But he died on his way back to Mecca. And he never met the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the Prophethood. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said about him, إِنَّهُ يُبْعَثُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أُمَّةً وَحْدَةً This man Zayd will be raised up on the Day of Judgment as an Ummah by himself. Why? He avoided the norms of the people. He opposed the society of his time. And he remained upon Tawheed when there was nobody around him upon it. <clears throat> so back to the man from Bani Israel who told his family, cremate my body. Because if Allah gets a hold of me, He's going to punish me with a punishment that nobody else would be punished with. <clears throat> so his family, they carried out his instruction. And here he is now, the Day of Judgment comes. فَأَمَرَ اللَّهُ الْبَحْرُ فَجَمَعَ مَا فِي وَأَمَرَ اللَّهُ الْبَرُ فَجَمَعَ مَا فِي So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very easily ordered the land to bring back what was remaining of him. And Allah ordered the ocean to bring back what was remaining of him. And this is easy for Allah. إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ When Allah wills for a thing to be, he says to it be and it will be. This is something that's very easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now he finds himself standing in front of Allah on the day of judgment, having done nothing to prepare himself for that day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him, لِمَ فَعَلْتَ هَذَا Why did you do that? Why did you order your family to cremate your body? Distribute the ashes. What was the reasoning? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing of the reasoning. He said, قَالَ مِنْ خَشْيَتِكَ يَا رَبْ وَأَنْتَ أَعْلَمُ He said, because I feared you, O Allah, as you already know. As you are already all-knowing. The reason I did that was because I feared standing in front of you on this day. Now this is a man who had nothing. He had not prepared anything. Remember, لَمْ يَعْمَلْ حَسَنَةً he did not do a single good deed. But the fear of Allah entered his heart. Maybe for a moment, maybe for a few moments, maybe just before he knew that death was coming, the fear of Allah entered his heart for some period of, of time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. Look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? A man that lived a life full of sin, and thought he could escape, thought he could outplot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and escape the accountability. Yet because it was the fear of Allah that led him to do what he did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. Now the question we have to ask ourselves is what would that fear of Allah do? And what does the mercy of Allah do to a person who lives their life with the fear of Allah, living by it, acting upon it, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Arham al Rahimin. Aqul ma tasma'una wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum tastaghfiruhu inna huqul ghafur al Rahim.
الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على نبيه المصطفى That fear of Allah if it resides in your heart that alone can be your salvation that alone that true fear of Allah alone will be enough to save you on the day of judgment <clears throat> and the stories like these they demonstrate to us the immense mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Therefore, a believer should never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُ مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْكَافِرُونَ None loses hope in the mercy of Allah except for a disbelieving people. Except for a disbeliever. So it's never a quality of the believer to lose hope in the mercy of Allah. It doesn't matter what past. It doesn't matter what's been written in your book for the last five or ten or... 50 years, don't as a believer, don't ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about the fact that when you open the Mus'haf for the first time, when we hand people Mus'haf, we hand people Qur'ans, copies of the Qur'ans, at the da'wah tables that are growing and expanding every day, bifadlillah, somebody gets handed a, a copy of the Qur'an for the first time, and they open it, whether it's the Arabic or the translation, they open it, what's the first thing that they're going to see? They open the Surah Al-Fatiha. Bismillah, his name, in the name of Allah. Who is he? His name is Allah. Bismillah. And then what? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Mercy and more mercy. Two names that indicate the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not because there couldn't have been another name of Allah that's mentioned there, another attribute of Allah that's mentioned there. However, to show how vast the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, look at the narrations, multiple narrations about the intercession that takes place on the Day of Judgment. People will be allowed to intercede. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he said, Shafa'at al-Mala'ika. Angels will be allowed to intercede on behalf of some people. They will come and argue on your behalf because of deeds that you used to do, because of your connection to the Qur'an. Angels will come in when you're being held accountable to speak on your behalf. Shafa'at al Angels will intercede. Wa shafa'an nabiyyun. Then the prophets of course will intercede. They will intercede on behalf of their nations. Raise their ranks in Jannah and pull some people out of the hellfire and open the gates of paradise. There will be various intercessions that take place on the Day of Judgment. Wa shafa'an mu'minun. And then believers will be allowed to intercede as well. They will be told, go back. Bring out of the fire whomever you find that has the weight of a coin of faith. Pull them out of the hellfire. Then half a coin. Then mithqala dharra. If you find anybody left in the fire that has even an Adam's weight of faith, pull them out of the hellfire. Then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he said, وَلَمْ يَبْقَى إِلَّا أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ until there's no intercession left except for who? Except for Arham al Rahimin. Except for the intercession of Allah. Why? Only because He is Arham al Rahimin. So Allah will take out a group, a handful from the handfuls of Allah, from the hellfire. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, Lam ya'malu khayran qat, who had done no good whatsoever but they're what they're pulled out of the hellfire and one narration without any action or any good that they put forward they're pulled out of the hellfire why because allah is because allah is the most merciful that's the only reason that is the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if that mercy can reach somebody who never did a single good deed does that mercy of Allah do to a person who lives upon faith and who lives with the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their life? Allah said in the hadith Qudusi, وَعِزَّتِي لَا أَجْمَعُ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِي خَوْفَيْن وَلَا أَمْنَيْن I will, my servant will not experience two states of fear nor two states of feeling secure. So the one who feared me, feared me the one who feared me in this dunya, I will give him safety and security on the Day of Judgment. If you fear Allah in this dunya, you will have safety and security on the Day of Judgment. And whoever feels secure in this dunya, 
أَخَفْتُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Then I will make him fear. They will fear the terror on the Day of Judgment. The one who feels safe from the punishment of Allah here will feel the terror of the Day of Judgment. But the one who fears Allah here will be safe and secure on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet Muhammad he says, عَيْنَانِ لَا تَمَسُّهُمْ النَّارِ Eyes that will never see the hellfire. Eyes that will never see the hellfire. What did these eyes do? بَكَتْ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ They shed tears out of the fear of Allah. If your eyes shed tears out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe even one time, those eyes will never see the hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who attain His mercy. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cause us to be of those who live with His fear, with His khashya, with taqwa in our hearts all the time. 